is Robert Shelton. I'm a professor in the sport and physics here at the University of Melbourne, and I'm standing in for David, which is uh, very difficult to choose to fill, and he sends his apologies for his own sabbatical, seeing your curiosity will take over the next few years. Um, very uh, pleased to be able to introduce to you tonight two very interesting characters, one an old friend, Professor Hans Buckhoff from ANU, Australian National University, Professor of Physics there, and Patrick Heelan, who is from Questacon. Uh, Patrick is quite different from the usual people that I introduced. He is uh, perhaps an artist and an actor before uh, a scientist, but he loves science and loves to convey that to you. He's from Questacon, as I said, and he is the coordinator of the Excited Particles Theatre Group there. Uh, so if you're ever in Canberra, please go along and have a look at Excited Particles and see Patrick's work there. Uh, Hans uh, is uh, a very, very uh, well-known and highly regarded physicist, not just in Australia, but around the world. Um, he's a member of the Order of Australia from 2012, AEM will have his name. Uh, he's a, a fellow of, of the Australian Academy of Science. Uh, he's won many awards. So he's done a lot of very highly regarded physics. He's written a, a, a core textbook in quantum optics. He's been uh, uh, teaching at high levels in many universities around the world, and of course has written many scientific papers um, with the team. From my own point of view, I think that I remember Hans most of all as a networker. He likes to put people together, to bring people together, to put all their efforts together into achieving greater things. And he's one of the first directors of an ARC Centre of Excellence in Australia, brought a team of people together uh, and helped them achieve great things. And he does that still. He is now uh, officially retired, although I think he still seems to work just as much. And he tries to bring different research ideas together and mentor young people. And as he is tonight, to convey science to a broader uh, population, he, as you will see, clearly loves it and likes to bring you all on board uh, into sharing that fun. So without further ado, you came to hear him and not me, so I'll let him start and I look forward to uh, the talk with all of you. Thank you. Well, thanks everybody for coming. And, uh, can you hear me in the back row? No. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> a bit louder. Yes. What's the answer to the question? Okay, good. <laughs> no. Oh, yes. Physics is much older than 50 years, but the ARP turned 50 not too long ago. So we thought we had a look what actually happened in the 50 years, particularly in Australia. Did Australian physicists actually do anything interesting? And where will this lead to in the future? Now, 50 years, Patrick. Now, can you hear me? Yes. yes. And I do apologize here in the front if I'm screaming at you, but I'm, there's only one mic, so I'm going to be loud. Um, the AIP turned 50, and it happened to coincide that I'm turning 50 at about the same time. And one of the things that I've been most disappointed by physics about was the promise of that jetpack that everyone was going to have, and that I was going to live in a city with these little bubbles, looking down over these idyllic places, all these things. The camera's close, but it, the, the bubbles aren't quite there. And, I have to say that that's my big question, is I didn't get a jetpack, but we're going to explore and see what we did get in place of that jetpack. And we'll see if by the end of this, if the rest of you who are disappointed by that as well can maybe be appeased by the things that we have gotten, if that makes sense. All right? I now, don't think you need a jetpack. Do I need a jetpack? Well, I mean, you know, do I need it? Okay. We need to start talking about all the things that we actually need. Plus, <laughs> I will try not to actually just get into a, a personal argument. So when we look at 50 years of physics, what I did is ask my colleagues. And they made a few suggestions. And we are supposed to talk about all of this. Don't you love PowerPoint slides like that? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, me too. <laughs> so that, that's probably not a good idea. So we're going to have a few stories. Each one of these arrows is a story that we're going to tell. Starting with Alan something. Walsh. Alan Walsh, yeah, Melbourne. From Melbourne. Right? Yeah. So at the time, people obviously knew about light. It was well known that there are different colors, different elements, and people had spectral lamps. Well, they had spectral glass, and you have one, actually, if you get your Most red glasses. Most people have those glasses that we've given you, they're not 3D. Um, by the way, just to cover any bases, 
do not wear them when you drive. <laughs> All right? It can be exciting, but don't wear them when you drive. All right? Or even walking can be a little bit dangerous, but that's up to you. You can make that decision. All right? Cool. So if you look at one of these lamps up above you, what are you going to see? More like a rainbow, right? So that's a lamp that sends out many, many different colors. Is there anybody who doesn't have a set of those glasses? Excellent. I'll get, I've got some right here. Cool. Well, anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? No worries. So what people were looking at, what Ellen Walsh was looking at, is the question, can we use the uh, spectral colors to identify the atoms? And that's pretty straightforward. So if we look, um, where's the black button here? So here, I've got two elements. As you better to anybody who can identify them, just in the spectrum, it's fantastic. Um, all right, I'm just going to show you. My block one. Yes. All right. And the other. And the people way over there, sorry. Move that little forward. There. That makes it easier. So, what are the, uh, the atoms? Right. Anybody out there? This one? Yep. This is Mercury. You see the green, you see the yellow? Okay, and you see a distinct difference between this one and that one. Right? And this one is argon. Okay? So, alright, that's very pretty. Two the extra one off. What? Two the extra one off. Oh. That's the last one we can't. <laughs> okay, give, give it more light. Right? So why do we care? about that. I mean, it goes back to, you know, all sorts of people wanting to know why the colors are there, what they're doing, and why do, we, why do we really care? So we get a fingerprint now per atom. You can determine which color it is. You can assign a different atom to that. And you could start measuring how much it is. And the, really, the breakthrough that happened in Australia... Is it jetpack? No! Oh, sorry. It's jetpack. But it's useful. <laughs> is what Anna Walsh realized is that looking at the light emitted by the atom is fine, but he couldn't calibrate it. Looking at the light that was absorbed by the material allowed him to calibrate it. So suddenly he could measure how much there was. And that was the real breakthrough. Out of that came a whole industry of making absorption spectrometers. All started here in Melbourne at CSIO. Mm -hmm. All right. So why would you want to do that? Well, for instance, there was an incident in Japan when there was a, a, a plant that was leaking a whole bunch of mercury. The cats were going insane. Cats were had been eating the fish that had been caught out of the harbor that the mercury had been leaking into, and no one knew what was happening to these crazy cats. Well, now it's very simple. You just take a blood sample, put it on a slide, look at it through your spectrum glass, run some light through it, what's absorbed. You can see it just like that. You can see that it's mercury. The health of mercury poisoning in your blood. There's magnesium deficiencies that are identified all the time now. It used to lead to people living very horrific lives. And now, it's really easy to see, oh, there's missing some magnesium here. Take a pill, you're better. So, these have a lot of um, medical applications into what colors they can see when they put a thin film of your blood and look at it with the spectrum. So it's pretty cool. So it keeps you healthy. It keeps you in case you ever get it. Right? And you can always just look at stuff, and if you go through and memorize that your spectrum. Man is the first spark of genius. Ah, An energy yes. heat that ignited our city. Where were we? Oh yes. We need to understand the anatomy of atoms. As you can see, the electrons orbit the outer layer of the atom. These tiny negatively charged electrons are crucial to understanding the colored light show of different metals in fire. In the nucleus, the center of the atom, we have neutral neutrons and positive protons. The electrons whiz around the nucleus in a series of orbits known as energy levels. Each level is progressively further away from the nucleus and can only hold a certain number of electrons. Now, I have a question for you. How does one excite electrons? Now, this little movie was made by a school class in Canberra. The ARP runs a competition. Who has the best video clip explaining some physics? 
and they won that in 2013. I think they did a terrific job in making the movie, and it keeps on doing, and has flames in it. But are you happy with the physics? Is there anybody who is not happy is with not the happy? physics? Yeah? Tell us about your unhappiness. Well, so that there's okay. a, so, so you, more complete. We need a more complete. Yeah, and the, and if you think about it like a planetary system, like a mechanical system, you run into trouble. Like you're running into trouble. So this idea of of planets around nuclei is sort of nice, but not actually quite uh, what is real. Any other comment? How many electrons can you put into an orbit with quantum number n? N is one, two, three, four. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So we need we need the rules for that, right? No, you need one. You need the rules to say yeah. which n can be how many. So it gets a little bit complicated. Now this is a sort of Rutherford atom. This was very good as an explanation to fill the table of elements. It was useful for that. But if you really want to continue, you need something better. And the better is really coming through the idea that the electrons are not going on these orbits like little planets, <coughs> rather that you actually look at the probability where they are. So they are, they are most likely there in a shell, but that's not the only place they can be. And they're not going around on a path where you would know at any one time where they are. So quantum physics is moving into the realm where probability is really the big idea. And if we follow that up and say, well, what has Australia? They have made many contributions to this. One of them is from nuclear physics, where you're looking at what happens inside the atom. And here we have an image of an accelerator. That's a large tower, and we have high voltage accelerating it. And here you see the sort of physicist in 1961. Those are our heroes 50 years ago. Now, nowadays, we were pixelated. <laughs> it looks a little bit different. Um, so people ask these questions and, and the theories how very big nuclei, like recently element 117, is actually holding together is exactly that quantum physics. So Australians, and here is Nanda Vesgupta as one example, are making predictions of what you can measure. So they made the predictions, for example, for element 117. It was measured in Germany, because they have a different machine that can do this a little bit better. But the collaboration gave us another almost stable atom. So quite significant new ideas coming from Australia in that period. Yes. Now, to go there, let's go back even a little bit further and, and talk about when we started to look at things that were invisible and seeing things that there and starting to explore that invisible ray, you know, the, the x-ray. I love the fact that when I'm in Germany and my mother-in-law broke her leg, that she got sent for a wrong thing. It's not called an x-ray, it's called a wrong thing. Because, you know, he did that. So I, I think that's kind of cool. All these things started with Marie Curie then looking at these invisible rays and starting to, to stir up bunches of pitch blend to try to find out what's going to emit this kind of stuff. And what does that lead us to? Well, a lot of that led to the spectral analysis that we can look at different elements in our blood, that sort of thing. But it also led a lot to the Braggs, and you may have heard of them, and this is the International Year of Crystallography, um, the United Nations International Year, that is pretty much celebrating what these two guys did. The interesting thing is that my wife actually directly uses X-ray diffraction every single day in her lab, um, which I think is a fantastic thing, right? I take people there and we have to look at it and look at what they were doing. But the interesting thing was, <coughs> William Henry Bragg was in Adelaide. And he was at the university there, and they had 150 students. Totally university. Right? 150 students. And very quickly, a couple of years go by, and they, they doubled their student population. They got 300 students. And he started to have these really great ideas about this X-ray diffraction. And everybody is kind of going to smoke the And he's going, no, but really, seriously, this is really interesting stuff. Let's, let's you know, get some money. Let's start talking to people who 
are incidents. Here in Australia, there weren't that many people incidents. So unfortunately, they went back to England, where they did a lot of their work. Um, one of my favorite things, though, is the fact that this is here in Melbourne. This is one of the pieces of equipment that may have been used by them, I don't know. Um, but it may have been, but you can see this here. But what is X-ray diffraction? Why is that an important thing to lead us into some of the other stuff that we are utilizing today? So what you, what you do in these diffraction is that you look at the grating. So we come back to our atoms, you pack them very regularly, you put your X-rays in, and what you find, and this is what is called Bragg diffraction, is that the X-rays move off in very well-defined directions. So if it's very regular, there will be X-rays going here, there will be X-rays going there, and you can reconstruct it. You can actually measure the separation between the atom, you know what the crystal is like. Now, we found a, a, a nice little demonstration for that. Can I? Where's the off button here? Oh. <coughs> that one. Blank? Yes, yeah, blank. Blank. So, I give you, if I give you that and you put your goggles on. What do you see? <coughs> Do you see something three-dimensional? Yes. Can you see it with one eye? Yes. Is there anybody who can't see it with one eye, the three-dimensional? So all, all of you see it with two eyes, all of you see it with one eye. Well, the thing is, we have no explanation for that. <laughs> okay, have you got an explanation for that? Please let us know afterwards, because we don't want this to take all night, but <laughs> seriously, um, we've had a few explanations thrown at us, but they're not satisfactory. So please share with us. So um, one of the interesting things that we wanted to do tonight is show something that is kind of new and that we haven't done before, and, and to include you in the discovery process. So that's a demonstration of what a crystal looks like. And at Bragg's age, and this was 100 years ago, that was a big progress, so we could understand crystals. But it got better. Here we have Peter Coleman. He came from Adelaide. Yep. Moved over to the US, returned from there, came to Sydney, worked at CSIO. Now, at that stage, when he was working in the um, 70s, 80s, computers became powerful enough to be able to reconstruct much more complicated situations than a simple crystal. And so you can actually take something like an influenza virus, that's what you see on the right hand side there. That's actually the chemical composition of what gives you the flu. Now there's many of those, but he was able to do wire x-rays to reconstruct it and he discovered that whatever type of virus you took, there was something in common. There were certain parts of the virus which were always the same which allowed people to design a drug to treat just those bits of that virus and therefore lessen the symptoms. Right? So now you're, if you're taking a sick day, you can feel a little bit better. And actually not need to be sick, maybe, but I won't tell anybody. Okay. So physicists yeah. were responsible to get rid of the Australian city. <laughs> now from X-rays, we don't do it like Röntgen anymore. We have much more powerful sources. So here you have one located here in Melbourne, it's the synchrotron, a big investment, more than $100 million went into it. It has several beam lines, that, which means that several groups of scientists can work with the one machine at the same time using different stations. I think this must be a pretty early photograph because it looks a bit empty. It's now filled up with lots of experiments. No, what would you want to do? You want something well, practical? Okay, I mean, the, one of my jobs is to try to find ways of communicating this type of science to a lay audience, uh, people who, you know, want to see why it's affect me. Well, one of the interesting things is that people have found that you can actually identify gold deposits through the leaves of eucalyptus trees that are growing above them, because the gold gets into the root system and it actually goes into the leaves and they can utilize some you have to use a spectrometer, you do that kind of stuff, you can find the gold deposits that way. All right, so that's one of the ways that it actually is used. And that makes the public go, oh, okay, all right, I'm gonna get some these special dogs, we'll make them see the trees in gold. 
gold. But um, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll be marketing those later. But um, unless one of you wants to come up with that, that's fine. You can have that. There are many other uses of synchrotrons, yeah. lots of to do with medications, with yeah. health, with materials, but this one is pretty cute. So go around WA, collect a few leaves, and see where the gold is. <laughs> now, um, Robert Hanbury Brown is one of the most interesting people that I've come across in like, the history of, of um, science, especially radio astronomy here in Australia. I know we're now making a big deal golden leaves, now we're going to look at the radio astronomy. Sorry, that's just how it works. I'm going to run a different stream now. Um, Henry Brown, I don't know if you've read his book often and that sort of stuff. If you haven't, you should read it. It's pretty good. But he was a radar specialist. And in World War II, or World War I, and he was in Britain, and they were working on radar installations to try to do air to ground, service to air, type of radars, and they were failing miserably, but learning a lot. The war came to an end, and then he had this idea about, you know what, maybe we should utilize this technology for other stuff. We should utilize it to, to maybe, you know, do other things. So I'm going to go out looking for ways to utilize this. So he ended up going to the United States, and, and he ended up going to MIT, where Ravi was the, the head of the boss, yeah. scientist, so the, the boss there. But because the war had ended, he had a huge surplus of scientists and researchers and staff that he needed to get rid of. And Henry Brown just happened to come along at a time when there was no job, so he wasn't going to get a job. But he asked Robin, he said, what, what are you going to do? How are you going to go about you know, dealing with this overstaffing? And Robin said, I'm going to put out an expression of interest. And everybody who expresses the interest to stay, I will fire. And he had this idea that people who were getting too complacent weren't going to give him good research. Henry Brown wasn't quite that brutal. He actually, but he took that on board and he you know, moved around in his life. He, he always remembered that. So he ended up trying to find funding for radio astronomy in the United States. <coughs> there wasn't much. Um, there was no money there. And before we saw the Braggs, they actually went, you know, hey everybody, we've got this great stuff, extra diffraction, extra diffraction. Okay, we'll have to go to Britain to do it. Now it's coming full circle, and Hamburg Brown came here to Australia. Now, astronomy, there's a few reasons to do astronomy in Australia. One, we've got a great view of the sky, we've got central pointing, all that kind of stuff that goes out of sight in the Northern Hemisphere. Okay? There's still great astronomy in the Northern Hemisphere, but here was the spot to be. There was funding, and he came with the notion of staying for two years. He ended up staying with 27, and, you know, the, all, all that, but, that's how that kind of works. He said some really interesting things like the Narrabri Observatory, um, setting up the, the interferometry there, but we'll move on a little bit from that. But he was here, and all of his stuff has led to what we're doing now, which is the largest science experiment on Earth. And it is the square kilometer array calculator project in Alaska. Whitefield Array right now is bringing in data that's really fantastic. And they're already starting to work on that toward that. So the Pathfinder project is getting there. But again, this is the kind of stuff that has started here in Australia. And if you look around <coughs> the world at, especially in radio astronomy, but, but all sorts of astronomy um, institutions and telescopes, you will almost always find Australians there because when, they, when Australians go through a, a radio astronomy, course, and they start to learn radio astronomy, they actually have to learn the engineering behind it as well. Um, and so, in most places, it's Australians who are leading the way with that research. So, I think that's kind of cool. So, with the breaks, we had people who came here but left because it was more interesting there. With Henry Brown, we got people coming because there was funding. And we have other examples. Brian Schmidt came from the US. Now, if you want to do astronomy nowadays, 
you do big surveys, you look at the whole galaxy, you look at the whole universe, and so you have to combine telescopes from across the world. And Brian came here to do that. And what he wanted to do is measure the age of the universe. Back when I started my PhD in 1989 at Harvard. And so three years, 11 months, and four days later, but who's counting? Uh, here I am showing my PhD supervisor, Professor Bob Kirchner at Harvard, my result for the expansion rate of the universe. And you can see I'm very excited about it, because the answer that I got was that the universe is about 14 billion years old, or that's a Hubble constant of 70 in current me uh, measurements. Uh, myself and Nick Sunset formed in 1994, who was competing with Saul Perlmutter's group. We did talk about working together, but the reality is we have very different ways of approaching the project at this time, and so it became clear that we needed to do the projects in our own ways, and this set up a competition between two teams the High Z team, and the Supernova Cosmology Project. And uh, here you can see Saul Perlmutter, the leader of the Supernova Cosmology Project, and myself trying to punch each other out. Uh, we had a spirited competition, but I think most of the time uh, we were very well behaved. And certainly one thing is clear, science benefited from the competition. And you all aware of the outcome? We have now a better understanding about the expansion and the dynamics of the universe. And both of them, both competing team, won the Nobel Prize for this discovery and for their perseverance of getting the data. So clearly, astronomy is, is part of our story, what Australia can deliver. However, with regular astronomy, we can do more. That's right. So astronomy, a lot of people think is about us and let's look up in the sky and what's that going to do for me? Um, does anybody know who he is? Does anybody recognize him? Really? Does anybody recognize him? And, and it's okay to not. Don't feel bad, okay? Because no one has so far that isn't related to him. Okay. <laughs> Even so, with that, we're not sure. But anyway, no. So I'm just going to show you something that he is responsible for, and you might be able to then go, ah, oh, but maybe you won't remember the thing. Well, you know that symbol. Mm -hmm. Does anybody use that today? Did anybody use that symbol today? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's taken over the world pretty much. And the beauty of that is that it came out of research on radio astronomy for us to try to be able to distinguish and eliminate noise and eliminate other things out of the signal that we want to look at. And his name is John Sullivan. There it is up there. And he is really, that's really amazing. It's really, really cool. Um, I have a little demonstration here that I hope I'll be able to do. Right, Flip? Oh, I'll do that first. Now, what did he do? Why did he get famous and why did we earn so much money as a country? Now, this is actually from his patent. And I find it remarkably clear. Some patents are a bit confusing, maybe deliberately confusing. But this one is very clear. Namely, what it shows is that if you wanted to connect two computers, or two gadgets, two tablets, or iPhones with each other, and they're in the same room and they're emitting radio waves, you will find that you have many different paths. So you can go directly, you can go indirectly, <coughs> and you would find very quickly that machine number four gets very confused. It could not distinguish between all of these paths. Now when we do that and think about acoustics, we actually call that an echo. So let's play a little bit with an echo. All right, let's play a little bit of an echo. Let me turn it on the right. Excellent. No. All right. Okay, you ready? That's my idea. No, it's my idea. That's my. No, no. My idea. Idea. My idea. Oh, no, my, my idea. idea. That's my idea. No way, it's mine. Idea. That's my idea. My idea. That's my idea. My idea. My idea. My idea. That's my idea. And we can add more. And we can add even more. A lot of noise there. So, the device isn't getting the right signal, and you're getting a lot of noise. I'm interested to hear that this is an easy way of doing this. So, before John Sullivan, that's what the other computer basically had. All of these signals coming from different parts. 
So they had to come up with an idea. That's of my idea. Is it your idea? That's my idea. That's my idea. That's my idea. Okay, that's my John's idea. idea. <laughs> However, there are a lot that's of people around idea. the world all saying, well, that's, that's my, my idea. idea. Oh, yeah, that's, that's my, my idea. idea. However, I'll stop by now. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Alright, cool. And so what was just around the corner, if you then look in the patent to the next few pages, that was his idea. It needs an electronic circuit which basically does something called a Fourier analysis. It looks at the frequency of the light of the radio waves. It uh, finds a way of how to play with the frequencies. And at that time, in Australia, it was just possible to put it all on a chip. And Australia was actually very far ahead, thanks to the radio physics and the radio astronomy, to make a little chip that could analyze all the frequencies, could shift the frequency in your communication, and filter out only the direct path, and get rid of all the echoes. That, in a nutshell, is what the invention is. Now, there was a lot of argument about it. CSO persevered. They actually took them to court, and one of the rare things happened, Australia won. And it brought in about $200 million per year for quite a few numbers of years to have this patent. And they took on every computer company one by one. <coughs> HP, UK. Once they had them, they went to the next one. Dell, etc., etc. So, one of the positive stories, and that's why we call him a hero. That's right. And it, it, it's, it's a full of implications. And there's so many people who don't realize that. So I think it's worth it. All right. Now, radio waves are fine, but if you really want to be fast, if you want to get the big data rate, you have to go optical. And optical means you're going to use a laser beam. No, no that's not different. Oh, right. well, we've got a laser beam for you here. You better put on your goggles, perfect. I'm safe behind the laser. Right. And if I take my watch, I'll see you safe. You think it's dark enough? Just make it darker? Make it darker. If you can find your way back here. Yeah, I'll see. Alright. Tell me if I can't see. Yep, all there. Yep, go. That's fine. Well, what we want to show you is that the laser beam goes in a straight line. Do you believe us? But now when Yuni still has chalk. <laughs> <laughs> and that's good. Right, actually, I'm sorry, I over did <laughs> So this is about the straightest line you can have. It's actually the definition of a straight line. It's our coordinate system. Light follows the coordinate system. Now, how could you bend light? Give us some ideas how to bend it. A mirror, yes, we could put a mirror in and you could send it around. Here's an example of what you could do with a mirror. Right? You can send it in and send it in a different direction. Yeah, that's fine. Give me another example. Water. Water. Why would water bend what light? Okay, diffraction, that would normally send it off in a different direction, but you're very close. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. A prism, yes, a lens could do it. So it's basically materials that either have a refractive index, so they can actually bend the right as it's in the lens, or it can be confined. What are you up to here, Patrick? Uh huh, okay. So I take my laser beam. Is it still going straight? Yeah, it yes. goes pretty much. So let's fill it with water here. All right. Anybody knows a good song? No, apparently. Yeah. That's all right, go a bit more. That's fine. So what we have is the same laser. Same apparatus, we just put some water in between. Oh, 
And what do you find? The light gets stuck inside the laser. Why is that? The light gets stuck in the water stream? Yeah. 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 Higher humps. No. Now come on, that's right. Uh, that's yeah. fine. Okay. Good. So, simple observation. The water, as a light which is inside the water, can't escape as soon as it hits the edges of the light it's trapped inside, it follows the water down into the bucket that's just a fun demonstration but it's the same as you can do with a bunch of fibers so that's what I got here which you might recognize as the 19 whatever 80s, beautiful lamp is basically is what you're using to communicate with everybody else all the signals across the world are now going through fiber optics. What has it got to do with Australia? Did we invent that? No. But we made an important contribution. If you bend one of these fibers, you can actually see, and you see it right at the beginning here, you're losing light. Right? Why is it blue here? It comes out of the fiber. When you bend it more, it actually gets stronger. So this light loss is quite a disaster if you want to talk between here and the US. You have a long distance, so you can't afford to lose your light. The Australian contribution came by inventing an amplifier that was living inside the fiber. By putting other materials in there, you can actually amplify the light while it is propagating. That's called an urban doped fiber amplifier, and it's the essential component if you want to go long distance. And that part was invented by Australians. Not only was it invented here, but they actually formed companies and make it. Now, well, the company is called Finizar. You've probably never heard about it. It's a big international company, and it supplies these types of components to the networks all around the world. And it still lives in Sydney. It happily exports we don't even know about it. So there are these hidden gems in physics that actually did a lot to give us what we need, the communication. Still no jetpack. I know, still no jetpack. Yeah. If you want to take that to another level, you can use the fibers and you can actually make them to measure things. So you can actually detect, for example, the flu virus or other medical conditions. And this is exactly what's going to happen in the moment, Tanya Monroe, she is in Adelaide with a new Centre of Excellence there, IPES, with a whole lot of people across Australia together inventing all sorts of applications, many of them in the chemical and medical area, using fibre optics. So not only have we got cures for it, but we can now also detect it. And again, that goes from Australia to the rest of the world. And, you know, this now goes back just a little bit further. But, you know, Einstein said, yes, it's this bubble electric effect. Australia is a place on Earth that has a huge amount of sunlight. Why don't we use it? Well, we do. And all throughout the history of this stuff, Australia, all about the photoelectrics and the, and the solar stuff, Australia has led the way and then kind of gone, eh, okay, eh, whatever. And so it's, it's been this interesting, interesting scare climbing you know, events. So, like here, all right? Not, 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 yeah. University of New South Wales really was doing some really good stuff here. And then other things going on here. This, this stuff up here was basically really expensive. It wasn't actually silicon. University of New South Wales was doing pretty much the max of what you can do with silicon. Sorry, I should go back a little bit. I yeah. mean, skip me ahead of myself on this side. With silicon, you can only do so much. And we can get a pretty good um, return on our investment by getting up at really the best is about 28%, right? Yeah, 28% yeah. is the best. That's it. This is the solar cell you have on your house. This is, at the moment, made out of silicon. And you can see over the years how it got better and how New South Wales University quite frequently heard, held the world record. And even now, we're looking at 2010 to 12. The world record is flipping forwards and backwards between different countries. 
but Australia is always in the map. The one weak thing is we never had the big factories. These guys actually trained the Chinese who set up the big factories in China. These guys trained the German students who set up the big factories in Germany. How do we ever get around of building the big factories here? That's a big question. I don't have an answer, but it happens again and again. But the research is starting here, and, and it has really good implications around the world for this. Um, so it's, yeah, it's just an interesting thing. It always seems to go overseas. So we'll work on that, right? You guys have homework. <coughs> so now we're back to utilizing those photons. Yeah, so let's go back to Henry Vaughan. And do you know already, he did great things with the radio waves. He also came up with an idea that was related to light, to photons. He could actually show that you can make photons, pairs of them, that you could actually see if one photon is here, another photon is exactly. No, I don't no, need to no, light. Why are you playing with the light? Oh, like with with photons, why not? I know, I know. So photons come from 60, 70 years ago. In those, pe those times, people actually only thought about photons. They were actually around before that. <laughs> we named them. We named them. That kind of stuff made us feel better. <coughs> but now photons are real. That's a photo detector. If I hold it up to the light, every little click is one photo. It sounds like a Geiger counter, and it is very similar. You just have to remember that a gamma ray, a Röntgen ray, X-ray, has a lot of energy. Photons are fairly low energy, but we can detect them. So, photons are real, you can hear them, one by one. We have this modern technology. Now, this might relate to your... Uh, but I come to that now. Okay, you okay. have to be patient. Okay. <laughs> now, people were debating for a while whether photons should be waves, because we know from optics that light is propagating by the wave, or whether it should be a particle. Now, we know that there is actually no distinction. You can have a setup, like this one here, where you send the light through two slits, and it's waves, so you see that the waves here are interfering, and so we have big waves, and we have big waves there, and we have a cancellation at that point. That means we have a high intensity, a lot of light on this side, I have a high intensity here, but I have nothing in the middle. Now we can do that experiment with a very sensitive camera, very much the same camera as you have in your iPhone, or for taking pictures, but this is so sensitive that every one of these blicks there is one single photon. And we're back to our idea of probability. You see where we have a lot of light, there's just a very high probability of finding the photons. There are more and more photons coming in there, and if we count them, we're counting all the photons on one line here, that's what the red curve is, you see it gets higher and higher, but in between where it's dark, well, it's not perfectly dark, but the probability is low. So the idea that photons are particle, correct, for detection and for emitting light, light propagating as a wave, also correct. As long as we use the probability concept, there is no contradiction. So instead of a jetpack, why don't we use this invention of the 80s? Okay, well, why don't we ask? Teleportation. Wouldn't that be better than a jetpack? You have seen this in the movies, right? You might remember this, Captain Kirk always teleporting others around. What's wrong with that? Does anybody believe in teleportation? Yes, you believe in it? Well, up to 1990, the physicist clearly said it can't be done. And the reason wasn't so much about what you teleported, there was a very fundamental reason, 
and that had to do with quantum physics. Namely, if you teleport something, you can never be 100% certain that you teleport everything. A small fraction would be random. Now, would you want to be teleported at 95% probability, Patrick? Depending on which 5%. Can't tell you which 5%, right? 99? You're happy with 99? I'm picking a random part of you which get lost. Right? Now, in quantum physics, there's also a no cloning statement, means there's no backup. Sorry, we can't write you down and then teleport you and put you together in case it didn't work. If the 1% is lost, it's lost forever. No backup. So you could imagine, what are you playing with my photons? So, you can imagine that teleportation was better than water. If we can't have perfect teleportation, it's no good. However, at about 1990, theoreticians predicted that there was a little loophole, that you could actually get around it as long as you prepared the atoms at both ends of the teleporter in some particular way, namely that they had one origin. There were sort of twin atoms. Teleportation is really about, I take something apart, I send the information somewhere else, I have a bunch of atoms and I recreate what I have. That's teleportation. It's sending the information, not the material. If I had the material together, and the buzzword there is entangled, these things that were created together, then you could do it. Now, nobody has really done that yet, but at least the Australians played a little game in that, in that they said, well, we can teleport photons. We can take a bunch of photons here, we can send the information, and we make a laser beam which is identical to the one we started with. And that was the experiment done in 2002 in Australia and in other groups. We got a bit of problem with that, didn't we? Yeah, there's, the, the press got a hold of it. And big news, I mean, they teleported it. A laser. We told them we teleported a laser beam. They crossed out the word beam, and we had a lot of trouble with our Beam is boring. <laughs> beam, beam is very boring, yeah. <laughs> so we got into trouble, but we got out of it. Now, is that of any use? So I think it's a little bit of a long shot that we will actually ever see uh, teleportation. So the, the big difference now is we can't rule it out. <coughs> There's so many technical problems, it might not happen in our lifetime. However, there are other things you can do with it, and that has to do with security of um, information. So if we take a person, normally it's called, she's called Alice, and she talks to Bob, and she uses a laser beam. <coughs> That's fine, that we had that already with our fiber optics here. Right? Or we could be just through the air with a beam like this. Now we have the evil eavesdropper Eve, the person who listens in. She takes some of the light out, writes it down, and sends it back. If Eve is a clever engineer, she can do it, and nobody would know. Seems like the NSA has a few Eves in their ranks who do this pretty well. However, if we send the information photon by photon, then Eve has a problem. If the photon goes down to here, she has it, but it's gone. So Bob can't have it. If the photon is to actually arrive at Bob's site, <coughs> Eve can't have it. So we start with some really good information, and we end up with a situation where a little bit of that, this is pretty noisy, ends up with Eve, and then the other part ends up with Bob. Now Bob will notice, and there are clever ways of communicating forwards and backwards, finding out what went wrong, and he says, that's not safe, let's do something else. So in this way, we can set up a system which actually has secure communication. You can actually go up to the point where everything from Alice goes to Bob by clever mathematics going forwards and backwards, and Eve sees nothing. Now that is called quantum cryptography or quantum key distribution, and it might be the next generation how to communicate. So rather than teleporting, at least we have secure communication, 
and there's Australian company, says Quintessence in Canberra, and it's a Photon Victoria, isn't it? The other company. Yep. They are finished now. Oh, well. let's let's have Canberra do it. So there's an Australian company in the race, and there are other companies around the world that might give us this, and we're watched for it. So the quantum world is closed. We'll probably get to one photon per message. That's the best we can do. We'll probably go into a world where one electron per switch, that's the smallest transistor we can do, or we can have, a, uh, we can have one atom making a, a transistor. And some of these things are actually done in Australia. There's a research center that is for quantum computing and communication. Part of that is in Sydney. Part of it is here in Melbourne at Melbourne University. Part of it in, in Canberra. And they're working on making transistors smaller. So here inside this machinery, you have a transistor. And if you look at this image up here, you see a very sort of state-of-the-art transistor, right? You see some traces here, which are basically the conductors. This is the little wires on your computer chip. And you see there are 54 nanometers. What's 54 nanometers? Take one of your hairs. That's about 50 micrometers, right? That's one hair. This is a thousand times smaller than a hair. And that is a state-of-art computer. You actually have that. You can buy that, right? That's how small it got. What the, our colleagues in Sydney did is if you hone into this picture and just look at the middle, you get that picture. And you see that little dot. That's one single atom. And the one single atom can actually do the switching. It can do the job of a transistor. So that's pushing it to the limits. There's no computer around it, that's just a demonstration, but the one atom transistor is a reality. And it comes from Australia. So, we'll be in the race for the future. Now, we're actually going to, again, because we're now in a little bit of a different speaking of race in the future, we're going to go to the past. But we were in another race for the future. And it was rather unfortunate that it was at the time that it was, and that the people that were involved were in Australia and having to rely on the actual post system to be able to send their, their academic papers to be reviewed, get them back, send them, and go through that process. So what Patrick is talking about is the idea of a superconductor. So while Patrick is preparing an experiment to show you what a superconductor can do, this is a material, you normally have to make it cold, where you don't lose any of the electricity. It doesn't get warm, it conducts forever, it makes a perfect cable, it makes a perfect magnet. Now people had seen that effect, they couldn't explain it. And the theoreticians at the time were thinking, how can I explain a superconductor? Now there was a group of theoretical physicists at the University of Sydney, Shuffroth, Blatt and Butler, who came up with an idea that essentially we're talking here about pairs of electrons, a little bit like these photons that I entangled. They were talking about electrons in the superconductor. But as Patrick already said, communication in those days wasn't very good. So they wrote the paper, they sent out their idea, they also talked to some other people on the way, they traveled in the world. It took a total of 18 months between sending off the paper and actually in being published. In the meantime, an American team, Radina Cooper, published the same idea. You can speculate how they got to know about it. Was it just a slow mail? Was it a type of communication? But because we didn't have any fiber optics in those days, Australia missed out on being the place that explains the superconductor and the Nobel Prize that went with it. So we learned from that. We now have the fibers. We send our papers, and we get them published quicker. And so I'm just while we're talking about this, sorry, it took me a little bit longer, Hans. But yep. right now we have a very high temperature superconductor. Um, it's a ceramic material named yttrium barium copper oxide, and that's what's inside the alfoil. 
Del Toro is going to protect it from absorbing too much moisture from the air. Um, this will, at the temperature of liquid nitrogen, actually superconduct and, and cause this magnet to levitate and is trapped by. If you want to talk about that later, please come down and talk to me. But this is close to my deck, isn't it? Yes. I get my hoverboard and it's important. You could have your hoverboard. You get your, you get your liquid nitrogen on your backpack, you get your superconductor. The way it probably would look like it's like this. This is actually a train which is floating on a cushion of magnets on superconductors. So, oh, yeah. to show it a little bit differently. But there you go. So, think of ways that we can actually use this. This is pretty exciting, but you know, how is this going to help? <laughs> oh, Bob, right. switch me over. Let me switch you over. That's what it's going to look like. back on. I hope. Yes. Yeah. So that's probably going to be closer to your jetpack. This is a train. This particular example comes from Japan. We have them in uh, China now. The Germans made one, but they were never game enough to actually build one for whatever reason. They sold it to the Chinese. These things go at pretty high speed, five, six, seven hundred kilometers. So you have aircraft speed. And you might have to share your transport with others. Sorry, no individual no transport. Individual no. Okay. <laughs> now, another way of going about it is obviously flying. You remember that, Patrick? I do, actually. Where were we at when the moon was the first moon landing? Well, I was actually sitting on my parents' sofa, covered right in front of the television, pretty much glued to the screen. And, um, yeah. It's pretty cool. It's the 45th anniversary of that was just last week, mm -hmm. on Monday. So happy anniversary of Apollo 11 and that. So in the last 50 years, we went to the moon, and you probably have and seen. Yes. One of the other interesting things is that you saw the, the, the first step by Neil Armstrong, and you've seen the movie The Dish. Have right? anybody seen The Dish? Yes. There's, there's only one slight little thing that upsets a few of the guys in Canberra, um, and that is the Honeysuckle Creek. I call them the Honeysuckle Creek game. And they were the guys who actually did send that very first image. They sent the first bit and got Neil Armstrong's first step on the moon and that took in the ACT at Honeysuckle Creek. But that didn't make for good film or whatever, so it got kind of cut off. Oh, so the guys were a little bit sensitive at times uh, about that. But they're, they're, those that are left, they meet every year, they always watch it at the exact moment. They argue with whose watch is actually correct time. These are all engineers. It's a very interesting time to, to, to watch them, you know, find this out. But anyway, so that's another thing that Australia, because of the time of day when Neil Armstrong got to the moon, the Americans really wanted it to come straight from an American, you know, receiver, a tele, um, um, radio dish. However, Neil Armstrong said, I'm not waiting eight hours. I'm on the moon. I'm, 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 no, I'm out of here. And so that's why Australia got to send that. That's pretty cool. No, well, I think the, the dish version was actually better than honey Oh, yeah. I'm going to tell John. But anyhow, <laughs> so we started with rockets. As you know, the first um, moon landing, that was basically on, on big 7.5 rockets. But later on, there was a time, and this is now in the past, when they used the shuttle. Now, sending the shuttle up is actually quite exciting. But it's not the hardest part. Okay. Bringing a shuttle down is the hard part. If you look at that shuttle here. But Hans, it was so easy because we had computers. Yeah, yeah. The computer simulation to be able to do everything and show that it would come down perfectly. You bad. believe you believe that? It was, computers would not lie to you, would they Hans? <laughs> well, I can tell you. <laughs> These things fall off occasionally, that's fine. But when the first shuttle actually went up, they had a very brave test pilot on there. And he knew the controls, but nobody had ever flown a shuttle. And when he brought it back, he just brought it back. It was right at the margin. It was actually beyond the point he should have used his controls. So he brought it back safely, but something was deeply wrong. Your computer programs. What they had to do wrong with computer programs? They make everything well, perfect. They everything is perfect. Yes, but they didn't put the right condition in there. What they learned is that this was supposed to simulate a body coming through the air with all the properties of air. But they the air was perfect. It yes. was still, it was calm, 
there was uh, it was a perfectly high pressure day. There was no wind. There was right. No, it wasn't. So what they needed. What the guys needed in the US was a test of how something would fly in the atmosphere at that speed. But unfortunately, nobody in the US had a testing machine for that. Because they had computers for that. They didn't need a testing machine. Well, they actually had them and they turned them off. So yeah. Australia was a bit old fashioned, and this is a machine which was around at the time. And the only guys who could actually test the computer programs before they had flight number two of the space shuttle was an Australian team. And so they were able to actually tell them, hey guys, you didn't program proper air. You had nitrogen, you had oxygen, but you didn't have all the properties, and that matters. So that improved the space shuttle to make it much safer. Now here we have an example of the sort of things that are happening in, uh, oh, at, yeah. those, uh, uh, at those velocities. This is something, again, done here in Australia, where you actually have flow at very high, several times the speed of sound. You see here the shock wave. You see all that stuff here. Now, That's the stuff you have to understand. The really exciting bit about that is that mathematics had shown that all of those shock waves and all of those the things that you're seeing there exist. But no one had actually been able to, in, to visit, envisage it. No one could see it. And my favorite part of this they go back to Alan Walsh, and they basically got a camera, and they sorted it out so they could look at lithium and see lithium, and then they blast into lithium through here so that they could get that image. And it's the first time anybody actually seen those interference patterns and those, those, um, those shock waves. And that was in uh, at ADCA, I believe. That's right. You know, the Australian Defense Force Academy um, are the ones who did this. So that's really cool. World first, and this has really helped find out about what that next slide is. We've given you that preview before, uh, just to tease you and make you excited about it. So, the closest I can get to your <laughs> dreams, Patrick. All right, okay. Here's your dream machine. Okay, okay. Look at your dream machine. Based on our screen idea. What is this is a scramjet. It's an idea of an engine for a supersonic flying machine without moving parts. Sounds just the too good to be true. Just the geometry, <laughs> gas coming in, the thing flies at supersonic speed. Now, that's the closest we can offer to you, but it doesn't exist. But I noticed, I was just going to say, that's a drawing, that wasn't actually. <laughs> so, I think, Patrick, you have to be satisfied with good communication, safe communication, understanding the atoms, no jet tech. So here is some of the heroes. We didn't, we are not of time, we can't tell you more stories, but believe me, there's lots of things that Australia has contributed. So these are the people responsible for me not having a jet Yes. <laughs> um, one of my favorite things about science, and, and the, more I, the more I actually look at it, the more that I learn from my perspective, which is very different from what they said, is there's Max Planck, you heard of him probably. Max Planck, he was told when he was younger, not alive, but younger, that he was a good pianist, so when I said, you know, play the piano, he's really good at that, and physics, we know everything. So don't worry about that. All right? So I, I, I love that. Then, then we, we got knowing more because of Max Planck, who like, well, I should have done this and done that. We know more. And then we get to this point where we think we know what the universe is, and Einstein is telling us that we've got a, and Einstein said it, so it must be true, that the universe is expanding at this nice rate, it's either it's gonna slow down and it's either gonna stop or maybe come back in on itself, and it's gonna be this really beautiful mathematical equation, and therefore it's beautiful, it shall be. But then you get Brian Schmidt, who gets, you know, he's a uni student, and he's going, Einstein's wrong. Now, who are you going to believe? You know, if the uni student or Einstein here? Well, the uni student. And now, my favorite bit of that is he showed us that we actually know less than we ever thought we knew before. So we know more, but we actually know less. And that's a really interesting place to be. So the students ask me and say, you know, yeah, man, you know, Australia, what are we going to do? There's 
the amazing stuff that has been done. And there is so much still to be done. Everything there has unanswered questions. Everything there will lead to something else. And everything there is going to end up being solved by not people my age. You know, yes, I want a jetpack. Okay, I'll have to not, not have one. I can have one, but it's probably too dangerous anyway. Um, but looking towards the future, we've got mobile phones that can you know, simulate almost everything we can do. We can talk to each other. We've got Wi-Fi. We've got all these things that make our lives easier. Will they get harder now? I don't know. But there's all those questions that are still to be answered. They're going to be answered by some of you. You know, Hans still has some answers left. I think that there's, you know, these are going to happen, in, and so are all the children here that are going to be the future scientists. So on that, here's to 50 more years. I don't know. My child, because she's going to be five this year, she may have the life expectancy to be able to live to 120 and maybe regret that. I don't know. You know, we, we don't know what's going to happen. But what is going to happen is going to be exciting. So thank you very much for coming tonight. Thanks for not doing and throwing rotten fruit. We appreciate that. And um, do you want to say anything before we go? No, I think it's uh, something to be proud of, and it will just get me better. Thanks for your time. Same place, 6.30, there is a talk from Professor Wan Paul from uh, Chicago on um, dark matter. Understanding finding dark matter. So, so very good speaker and I can be very entertaining. Same place, August 26, 6.30. If you would like to ask questions, please come on down. Come on down, ask question here. Yeah. And feel free to take the dark glasses home. Look at that, don't drive with them. Again, I'm saying, you know.